Welcome to New York Parrot, I mean, the Parrot uh, Literary Corner of the Parrot TV. My name is Muti Olawi, and as usual, my co host is here with me, Dustin Pickery. Hi, Dustin. Hello. Uh, and uh, today we have a very unique guest. We've decided to go farther beyond the borders. We've been to different parts of the States. Uh, we've also been to Africa when we had time with uh, Oswald or Katie, but this time around, we're in India. So welcome to the show, Ertiker. Thank you so much. I'm extremely um, happy to be on this show and looking forward to this conversation. Great. Over to you, Dustin. Well, thank you very much. Um, so my first question is, you know, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your, uh, you know, your daily life and, and how it relates to your writing, how you structure around your poetry and uh, maybe your education background, if you want to include that. So hello, I'm Irtika Kazi. I'm from Pune, India. Um, and I am a poet by passion. Um, Professionally, I'm a German linguist, so I studied German particularly for uh, my career. And uh, I've been working um, as a German language expert since eight or nine years now. Um, yes, and uh, by passion, I'm a poet and I've been, I have quite a few uh, poems published to my credit. So that's pretty much about me. So how does your, um knowledge of the German language and in linguistics, how does that, does that at all factor into your poetry or your knowledge of uh, uh, poetic form or any of anything like that? Um, I would not say that it has a very direct influence over my writing, but I think being a multilingual definitely, um, you know, is directly or uh, it has a correlation with uh, linguistic creativity, right. is what I feel. Yeah, but um, for me personally, I I have tried to integrate a few words uh, in my poems, a few yeah. German words uh, in my poems. But I I would not say that it. Def I mean, it has a very very um, strong impact on my poetry as such. Do you think it has an impact in general on your? knowledge of the world and how that may reflect into your because I noticed there's a lot of international character to your poetry there's a strong cosmopolitan feel to it mm -hmm. uh, do you think that you know being involved with German uh, the German language and linguistics maybe factors into it indirectly in some way um yes because you know when I talk about landscapes uh, it definitely has that uh, impact on my poetry uh, but I would not say linguistically. So I am just trying mm -hmm. to integrate, uh, you know, two languages into one. I'm just doing something creative of that sort here. Uh, but uh, I mean, I don't think it's helping me that much. But definitely I've traveled, right. um, um, you know, to Germany and to German speaking countries. So it definitely has some, some semblance of, uh, you know, belonging there, uh, you know, in terms of uh, linguistic uh, or literary skills. What prompted your interest in Germany? You're all the way over there in India and, and is something, a teacher maybe, or like a, a TV show or what got you interested in, in the German um, language? So, yes, so it was my teacher who actually suggested me to go ahead, uh, you know, to learn German. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, specifically because it did have a lot of scope, work scope, work opportunities here in Pune. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so that is that was my main reason to opt for German. Uh, so I had a choice between French and German. So I had I, I had chosen right. German then. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so yeah. what was your what was your first experience with poetry? I mean, when you first realized or you first decided you were very passionate about writing poetry, what what was that moment like, and when did that happen, and and what was the impetus behind it? Um. Okay, so let me tell you, I was academically very good in <laughs> English <laughs> literature and poetry, and I used to perform in school, uh, you know, with all those um, 
with the gestures and you know um, speaking it out loud and with all the emotions uh, you know specifically shakespeare and poetry or uh, even plays for that matter julius caesar was one of my favorite plays in school mm -hmm. back then written by mm -hmm. uh, shakespeare so i think i was i was very much um, you know attached to this kind of um, um, performing uh, and then i joined um, like since 2017 i've been writing poetry uh, but I started writing good poetry, I would say, you know, uh, <laughs> um, from 2019. But then from 2017, I've been performing poetry in various open mics here in Pune and literary festivals. So, yeah, so I was kind mm -hmm. of practicing my passion as well. Along. I wondered if you could read us one. I, I have one to suggest. Uh, the kindness starts with my mother's <laughs> stride. I really like that poem. Okay. Could you read that for us? So we can get a sample of your yes. work and, and your approach. So um, just as a quick introduction, this is my book. I recently published it a month ago uh, with Clever Fox Publishing. And so I will start with the poem, The Koina Starts With My Mother's Stride. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, the Koina Starts With My Mother's Stride. I was afraid of the dark and things that moved. As a child, I imagined black birds chasing me with their high-pitched squeaking calls across the moonlit water. Everything comes at its assigned time, she said. I could not go to tea parties because I have mother's fingers, too small to carry a kerchief or hold a spiked pencil to do math. Mother now reminisces about her teachers from St. Paul's and how she was the most erudite of all pupils. The twinkle in her eye illuminates a thin sliver of the continent of moon in her threadbare dreams. She woke up when the first signs of spring emerged in the hedgerows along the Cass Plateau as she hummed with her the colors of love and loss. Her hands failing to reach those of the father. Mother is a seabird, creature of wide skies and distant oceans. Some mothers teach daughters to cook. Mine taught me to fish and fly. Whatever I picked first was mine. Thank you. I really like that first line. There's so much immediacy to it and it just it captures and captivates you immediately uh, uh what what is the essence of this poem what are you what are you aiming at to, to express uh, it seems like you're you know you're talking about your your mother and and uh right. you know i guess self-reliance in a way um so, so could you tell us a little bit about some of the th thematics of this uh, particular poem um yes so um, this poem is about my mother, and she is she has been you know a very instrumental figure um, in me choosing or you know going forward with this passion of mine. So if it hadn't been for my mother, I would not have been in in you know um, writing poetry or performing uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write something about my mother and you know where she grew up. She grew up in a, a small. I would not say small, but it's a historical town, which is called Satara, which is in Maharashtra. It's uh, in the Satara district of Maharashtra, and um, which is a very historical place. And um, and her father, like my, my maternal grandfather, was a poet mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but he used to write in Urdu, uh, specifically. So it did have... A, so I have a very strong influence from, uh, you know, my, my Nana uh, or my maternal grandfather and my mother as well, mm -hmm. because she has, uh, you know, been a very strong link between what I write today, my poetry and her existence. Wow. So you're speaking of the performances and, and is, is the Indian poetry scene. Is there any characteristics you notice that are especially interesting to you of amongst the performance crowd? Is there a specific style or a kind of uh, approach that you see or is there anything you particularly find interesting about it? 
Um, okay, so when I say performance, like I'm not very well versed with that. I just, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like to read with a lot of uh, guestique and, and emotion. Right. Um, but that is what I call performance. I do not know the details uh, of, you know, how do you perform well? Maybe there mm -hmm. are certain types of poetry which also deal with that. Um, but, you know, this has been on the rise, the performance poetry scene in Pune has been on the rise since quite a time now. And um, it, it's very happy to see that it's blooming. I have right. a question. I think it brings, uh, sorry, sorry, maybe, and, I have more, a question. Yeah. Um, do you, when you write, do you follow the rule, the conventional rule, like um, you said you love uh, Shakespearean writing. Do you follow this iambic pentameter? Trochea, tetrameter, et cetera, like that, to make it redemic or it just flow according to your mind? Um, no. So I do not follow uh, these rules um, because, I mean, I don't know. I just don't feel like following any so, kind so you of... Are not, you are not part of the establishment. Dawson. No. Um, <laughs> I, I, love, I admire the work. Okay. <laughs> I admire the work, but it's not... Uh, I mean, I don't think it's necessary that I should be following it. You know, okay. one thing I noticed in, in your collection is you open with an epigraph from Longfellow. What prompted that? Was was there a message or was it just you liked the the way the words yes, flow? Uh, that, that, yeah, um, that's that's been um, a very inspiring uh, poem for me that I learned in school. Um, mm -hmm. And also I've been mentioning a, a certain Mrs. Menon, uh, you know, in, in my book. Um, and okay. she she has uh, taught me poetry in school, back in school. And um, so I, I specifically love this poem. It's the Psalm of Life. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a verse from the Psalm of Life. And it's it's extremely inspiring. Uh, so that is why I, I thought of including that as well, along with Mrs. Menon's uh, mention. Well, that's wonderful. You know, tribute to old mentors, you know, people that have passed through your life and and right. uh, you know, it's, it's very nice that to do that. I think it's wonderful. Um, so um, what was the process for Stormbound? How did you order the poems? At? What made you decide what would go in what place? You know, did you have a specific organizational uh, mm -hmm. formula or was there like a, it was a kind of spontaneous? Yes. So, um, okay. So I, this would really um, sound very weird, but I have never followed um, poetic rules. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you've read my poetry, I haven't followed any, any meter um, or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, linguistic or um, um, right, right. Is in, in my poems. And it, it is very spontaneous, but I, I had made sure that I keep on editing and re-editing it until I am satisfied right. with the version I'm seeing of the book. So um, definitely, um, I'm a very moody writer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, took me, it took me three years to compile 35 poems in this book. And actually there were 40, but uh, some of them which I omitted um, from this collection. So yeah, so <laughs> I don't think it's a very impressive number, uh, 40 poems in three years. People write uh, so recurrently. Uh, yeah, so I think I did not follow any process as such. It, it has been okay. a very spontaneous journey for me. And I've al I'll always, uh, you know, followed my heart in this, right? Uh, um, do you also, you know, sometimes as a poet, I remember because I'm also a poet too, um, at the initial stage of uh, most sports, they always follow certain sound in them. Maybe the local lyrics or songs, they use mm -hmm. that to write. Do you, have you ever experienced something right, like there, this too? Um, I have also noticed that there is a certain orality to the poems. Um, you know, specifically when you see Hindi or Urdu poetry, uh, it's very easy to remember these and uh, narrate or recite uh, to the audience. But for English poetry, I, I haven't really seen that, uh, you know, many people uh, uh, in India, I'm talking about uh, the Indian scenario, uh, they go with orality more. Uh, so I, I've seen that for Urdu and uh, Hindi poetry a lot. 
what was the process of getting the book actually like you went with clever fox publishing which is self-publishing um what was the process like for you what stages did you go through to get the book prepared and and to get it actually on the market um with clever fox it was a very simple process so you know um i had it, it took almost 15 to 20 days uh, since the book was out uh, once the manuscript was submitted and uh, they, they, but it took me like three years to compile the poems, like, you know, in a very proper manner. And I, and I think that even right now, there are some poems which I never wanted to be in this book, but there was a certain limit, uh, poem limit um, mm -hmm. for a chapbook book as well. And that is why I had to include them. But, um, but with Clever Fox Publishing, it was a very smooth process. And um, yeah, I mean, they are fairly new uh, in the publishing scene. But, uh, but the experience was uh, extremely well. I mean, I did not have any qualms um, about the quality of the book, the printing quality and um, making it available to the readers. Can you read uh, Mermaid of Haiti? That the poem from Stormbound? Um, That's a beautiful poem, I love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I need to. Find it. Uh, okay. and, uh, Take the time, the... Sorry. We're here for you. Our listeners are watching to enjoy the flow of your lines. So that's not a problem. Um, as soon as you get that, you just let us know and then you can uh, start reciting. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, God, where is the point? Why can't I find it? I, I remember yeah. why you're still checking. Never. I remember that sometimes you present in German. German language. Do you also present in in uh, maybe Urdu or any other local languages beyond English? Uh, yes, but they are not my creations. So uh, I read or recite my uh, maternal grandfather's uh, Urdu poems. A cup, uh, you know, a few couplets that he had written. I mean, not a few, but now that have been preserved. Um, so yeah, I do sometimes uh, recite uh, Urdu poetry. All right, you can go back to okay. the presentation while we're listening. Yeah. So, uh, Mermaid of Haiti. Somewhere in the Caribbean, Lazarin holds a mirror to admire herself. Her long straight hair, a clarion call for marinas. The back of the mirror, the back of the mirror, a tautology of sexes. Bodies pressed, colliding, the lover, a smell of brackish water and stones. The mirror speaks of eternity, inundation, or two clashing waves or not. The ebb and flow of breasts, a regurgitating sound of oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Blue ash lips conjure up a storm. Tie yourself to the mast of your ship to resist the sirens until they call it a day. Fantastic. Thank you. That's impressive. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I love it and you read it so well. What is Lucerne? Is that, is this a specific story you borrowed from? Um, uh, or um, yes, it, it's derived, the concept or the story of this poem is derived from an article I had read uh, online uh, about Lucerne, which is in, uh, it's, a, it's a water spirit. Okay. Uh, of Haiti. Yeah. Wow. Wow. considered to be a, a malefic one at that uh -huh. so yeah and yeah it was all about that so whatever the the poem flows in a way which i mean this is that this has been derived from the article that i'd read about cool. last year and how she bewitches the the sailors um, or the seafarers um, right that's that's about it it's it's wonderful i love it i mean the sort of imagistic in some ways, the mirror speaks of eternity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really like that line. Um, yes. You know, and, and, on a, and another thing, outside of Stormbound, you published with the Cali Project. Um, how was that? Yeah. How, how, how did you come about that, uh, involving yourself with that, with Indie Blue Publishing? Mm -hmm. um, so actually it, it was a complete honor it still is a complete honor to be included in such a, a majestic anthology 
Um, and there are quite a few fellow poets who I've known who have also contributed to that. And of course, I mean, it talks about women power, women empowerment. And um, I mean, of course, I, I am someone who, who definitely is for that. And um, yeah, so it was completely, it was a great process to know the editors um, and to be working with them in this anthology. How, what, uh, how did you get involved with them? Did they, was it like a call online or, you know, something of that nature or you just ran across um, it? Um, no, it was, it was not through a call, but um, I mean, I had submitted to, to uh, them through their portals. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, that is how it worked. It was very usual. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so when you're, when you're out marketing your book, uh, what, what kind of reactions do you see from people when, when, you, when they're experiencing your work? And I mean, you, I imagine you get friendly reactions. I mean, do you ever have any negative reactions like, eh, it's not my thing or, you know, or do people really just enjoy what you're reading? Um, to be very honest, uh, I haven't got very direct feedbacks uh, about mm -hmm. my work. And I do not know why is that, um, why can't people, you know, be direct enough to give me a feedback on what I've written and how I've written it. Uh, but yes, I mean, people have really loved the, the, the book, the collected version, the collective book, the cover. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think I, I have heard, you know, from quite a few people that, you know, we don't understand your poems. Uh, wow. <laughs> and it becomes extremely difficult for me to explain it to them you know it shouldn't look like a lecture right in an English right, lecture right right so it, it, it's really hard it's to, very difficult to yeah answer. it's like you'd have to take the poem apart and rephrase it completely and show you know like you know you're basically just right. a tautology of sorts you know um you know as, people, a, as a form of interlude I would love if you can give us some some lines of um the grandfather or those that you love to read their lines in your local language perhaps in Urdu the ones um, you have offhand okay. uh okay so well I do not have it uh, memorized but uh, uh, let me get back to you uh, on this no problem is it okay if I just get back to you in like uh, two minutes no problem or, um, uh, it's okay no problem uh, as long as uh, what is important um, is that um, we just want our viewers to have a little bit taste of other tongues beyond the English language since you read mm -hmm. in those lines and you also present in uh, other forms that's not a problem so mm -hmm. we can give you time to um, to get the lines for us why uh, I'm on the show with uh, Dustin. Uh, Dustin, okay. uh, um, let's continue why she's uh, trying to get the, the lines for us, because this is very important. We want to hear from, I think so. uh, the, the, from the side. So generally speaking, if you look at some of the, the parts that you have these days, uh, Dustin, you will notice that um, they have some things in common. You can go and get it for us while we're waiting. Um, they have mm -hmm. a lot of things okay. in, in common. Um, one, one thing is that um, most of them are unconventional, okay? So right. and, um, the established ones too, or those that we can call the establishments, also sometimes go out of the convention. So what do you feel leads to some of this thing? Do you think that the convention is fading away or what? I don't think it's fading away. I think it's taken a, a back seat a little bit. I don't think form and conventional uh, models can really just disappear. I think they're so integral to the to the poetry uh, world. I mean, as we talked with Troy Campbell yesterday about form and the importance of restraining language to bring out the depth of it. And I, I don't think that form will go away. We, we go through these kinds of uh, I want to say political and social crises a, a lot where also poetry and culture reflects that. And I think a lot of this, uh, you know, like during World War II, uh, they, when we had the modernism, which was kind of a breakdown of the language and uh, to a certain degree. And uh, 
I think a lot of times society uh, and the political conflicts and things going on uh, lead to a lot of uh, disorganized forms. And, but you can also present a lot of, of depth of thought uh, in free form verse, um, as we see with Urtica's poetry, um, she's got some powerful um, thinking in her in her words. Um, so uh, for me, it's just it's the form is even if it if it were to go away, which I don't think it will. Um, it, there's still something to be salvaged in poetry as a as a uh, activity of a, as a mental activity. So um, for me, anyway. I believe uh, what I write, the reason I write poetry is because I think it conveys much more depth of spirit. The ideas or you know, concepts can be played with and kind of create a web and a network of, of um, you know, spirited ideas uh, in the language and it preserves culture. It preserves the spirit of a people, the national character. It helps push things forward politically, as we see with like Amanda Gorman's piece, you know, she addresses issues that many people may not feel immediate to them, uh, but when they hear her recite, they're like, hmm, maybe I didn't think of it that way, or, uh, and maybe they, maybe they feel, you know, repulsed by it, but they still react to it, you know, it still has its power, so I think it's, it's important that we consider that poetry has power, whether it's form or not, um, but I do think that form will not go away. I know that you know, uh, some writers believe that um, following the convention is just like uh, giving one, putting oneself in a cage, because it will be very right. difficult for you to flow with your mind, you know, to, to, to deeply convey your message to your listener or your readers. So what do you see to this? Uh... It depends on your message. I mean, if you're wanting to write a kind of confessional piece about some traumas you faced and it's cathartic for you and you want someone to experience it with you, maybe may be good to write a kind of chaotic, uh, you know, haphazard uh, poem with a lot of disjointed phrasings and, you know, uh, the words all over the page or whatever else you may use to convey your, your emotions behind that. Uh, I don't think you're putting yourself in a cage. I think you're letting the language free itself out when you use form, like you, you're, you're opening the cage door and letting the light that's already behind you strike in, and strike into the onto the forest floor there and and uh, lighten up in front of you and and guide you. Right. Um, so putting rules on your on your and restraints on your on your use of the way you you know the way you you write is not necessarily restraining to me. It's not. For each individual poet, they have their own methods, and you know, as they say, there's a method to every madness. So I think um, I don't think I don't I don't feel like when I write in form, I, I don't feel like I'm in a cage. I feel like I'm trying to um, think outside my own box because I don't normally write in form. Uh, and when I write like sonnets or villanelles or something, I feel like I'm approaching verse in a radically different way and completely conveying different emotions and thoughts that I would not normally convey. Looks like our friend is back. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I guess it's ready to present for us now. So our viewers are watching. Over to you, Eric. Take care. Um, yes. So I could find one uh, couplet, uh, which is written by my Nana. So I have hardly four or five of them, which have been preserved until now. And one of them uh, goes like this. It's an Urdu couplet. Um, Sahil par lakar safine dubo diye. Sahil par lakar safine dubo diye. Zindagi ne humko yu rulaya. Zindagi ne humko yu hasaya ki ro diye. Hmm. This is the couplet. And when you see that this also has a very uh, oral quality to the poem. Right. Uh, so it gets, yes. And it's eloquent. about the irony of life. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's about the irony of life. And um, so my Nana was a very creative person. Uh, so he, he, he writes about uh, Safina, which is, uh, you know, a canoe, uh, which is drowning uh, in, in water. And that is how his life has been. Uh, yeah, poetically speaking. So that's an irony of life. Wow. Impressive. Now, this is an interesting question. Uh, you, you, you're speaking of like, you know, drowning and so forth uh, the, uh, in his life as a poet. Um, 
do you think that maybe poets have a deeper capacity for suffering uh, than, than the normal individual? And then that brings out their inherent capacity for languages and, and thought more so than maybe like, you know, a common man kind of, you know, and maybe that's one of the reasons why they turn to the, the poetry. Um, I don't know, because I don't think that is the case, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, each and every individual has a, a certain level of endurance, um, right. of sufferings, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, doesn't have to be a poet or doesn't have to turn to poetry, uh, you know, to overcome that or rather not overcome and just, you know, dwell in agony and uh, melancholy. Right, right. <laughs> So where do you think the, the, the spiritual and emotional depth of poetry is derived from? Is it maybe just the mind or the uh, of the poet thinking deeply on things? Or uh, is there anything that um, you think maybe, maybe the process that comes from that? Um, I have been, you know, deeply intrigued by uh, religion and mythology. Uh, I read quite a lot of, uh, you know, quite a lot on mythology. Uh, on Islamic mythology, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm very intrigued uh, by the concepts, um, you know, presented in in this in this uh, in in the mythology, in the Islamic mythology, and that is where I've also come up with certain poems like Khizra. Um Khizra, who is you know, uh, is a mystical figure in Islam, is considered to be a mystical figure who is an immortal figure, and um, you know, someone who has. Uh, the knowledge of the world, mm -hmm. um, you know, and is is immortal, and you you can come across this uh, this particular this certain figure called Khizra in any of the person you encounter. So you know, it need not be someone who is uh, who has a certain individuality to him. It can be any person. Any person can be uh, Khizra, you know. So hmm. um, it's a very interesting concept about him, which I came across, and I thought I, I should definitely write about it. Wow, that's very interesting. I think, and that's sort of like almost a democratic approach that um, that you have, and you're thinking about uh, um, the charisma of a poet or as an individual, and and the myst mystique and mystic of a, of a person. Um, for like the we have the remainder of let's see like about five minutes left so um is there anything you want to address or discuss or leave with our, uh, our viewers uh, in terms of producing poetry writing poetry getting a book out marketing anything you want to say that you feel is important um, you know? okay so I, I would still call myself a novice mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point of time because it's my first poetry book and i'm finding my path uh, and way to get my book uh, more uh, you know out and uh, make it uh, you know more readable in terms of availability of the book and you know I, I want it to be um, accessible to more and more people and uh, considering that poetry doesn't sell right. very well so very you know it, it gets to difficult to do that very difficult to sell yeah, I've had sorry. the same it's yeah, very it difficult is, to sell very, I've, had, I've had the same experience yeah, myself right. It's, it's very hard to sell a poetry book. Uh, I find it's easiest to sell it by hand to, to people. Uh, so, you know, maybe if you want a um, and final note here, uh, you have a, you have a uh, what do you call it, a book launch coming up uh, Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to give the details mm -hmm. of that so people are aware of it? Yes. So uh, I'm launching, um, or not I, I mean, the, the quarantine train community uh, is, you know, a community of very well-versed poets in Pune, and they, they, they have been very generous in accepting this, you know, and uh, launching my book this Sunday, uh, March 14th, and at 6 p.m. Uh, IST. So, Excellent. I'm very I'll, excited. I'll be one of the ones we're reading there. I believe I'm reading The Mermaid of Haiti, if, you, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yes, <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to see if I can bring out a different voice in that poem. And when I read it versus when you read it, see if I or what happens there. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, this has been an excellent. Yes. And excellent, I also, uh, I would like to thank you, Dustin, uh, for writing this book. It has right. been much appreciated. That. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Maybe uh, just to, to kind of uh, let the time flow into uh, the end of the thing, would you like to read the Longfellow verse that you used as an epigraph at the beginning of okay. the book? 
unfortunately we would have had okay, um, so enough opportunity to do that um i guess okay. you have uh, fantastically uh, given us a lot of clues most of our viewers now would have learned a lot that um it is not onto you a uh, conventional that you can achieve anything meaningful you, as long as mm -hmm. you can flow your mind deeply you can convey your message without any stress so this is the message of uh, our guest today you don't need to be too academic to be a poet and you can convey your right. mind without stressing yourself we sincerely appreciate your time thank you so much for the time you spent thank with you. us we hope to see you next time when we invite you to join maybe other poets or other creative mind thank you so much dustin Subscribe to the channel. this is where we're going to end the show today mm -hmm. And um, ju just to uh, to end it, I would like to read uh, this verse. It's just a four-line verse. Okay. Um, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Thank you. It's Fantastic. from the Psalm of Very good. Great. So yeah. please subscribe to our channel if you want to regularly enjoy uh, Parrot Literary Corner on uh, Paro TV. So we we bring every day, we'll be bringing creative mind from different parts of the globe. If you're interested as a writer, contact us on uh, nypliterary at gmail.com or literarycorner at newyorkparo.com. Thank you so much. This is where we'll end the show. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me on this show. Thank you so much. Okay. Goodbye. Yeah.